Okay. Let's give them another round of applause to Cold Dow. Local here to the Ethereum, ETH Denver and Ethereum ecosystem. So thank you everyone for coming. We're going to jump into our next session. Again, my name is Jorge Cortez. I'm MC here for ETH Denver. And um, I'm representing and coming, visiting from Miami, Florida one more year. Excited to be here, sharing with all the community. I want to give a big shout out thanks to all the volunteers, to all the people that's making this happen, from volunteers to people on the staff. Thank you, everybody here in Denver, for making us feel like home. Um, so next up, uh, we're going to talk about incentivize what matters uh, and what incentivize APIs will build the decentralized public good. So for that, we have Robert Frost here with us on stage. Welcome, Robert. Let's welcome Robert with a round of applause, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm mic'd up, so I'm good. Hey there, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming by. If I'm correct, I think Vitalik's talking tonight. Um, I believe that's correct. Very psyched, looking forward to that. So um, I'm going to start first with a question. How many people here use the public cloud? I'm looking to see how many people are listening, because everybody's hand should be up. OK. <laughs> I'm talking about something which is sort of a fusion of things that are very interesting to me and should be interesting to the rest of us. Obviously, you know, we love blockchain, love DeFi, love NFTs, love all of that. But it's also good to look at how blockchains can be utilized in places where there's new money coming into the system as well. And public cloud is a space where a lot of money is spent. And so I want to break down what does it mean for us to actually make blockchains much more relevant to the public cloud. So to start off, let me just say, I like to say what I'm going to cover first and then go through it and then remind us at the end. We're going to do three themes. I'm going to try to move quickly because I want to make sure I get through to the end and the nice conclusions. The centralizing force behind today's public clouds, and then talk about what blockchain tech could actually allow us to have a decentralized public cloud. And you know, it's not a small problem. Uh, public cloud is huge, a lot of transactions. It's at a scale that is very hard for us to think about when we compare it to what blockchain tech is capable of. So it requires some careful attention. And then just very briefly, today's status and what's next. And everybody I've talked about before the talk who's in public cloud is very excited about both the status and next and find some of this stuff I'm talking about pretty surprising. So hopefully it's enjoyable to everybody. So one level set I wanted to start off from in the very beginning because a lot of times when people hear decentralized public cloud, there's a lot of kind of marketing and people get excited and say, oh, this new thing is the AWS of Web3, the AWS of blockchain. And you know, I want to talk about the real scale of what clouds are. Clouds are not just RPC services into the blockchain layer. There's a very rich stack that was established over time of lower la layer infrastructure, which are the kind of compute, storage, networking, a bunch of platform as a service, so load balancers, databases, things that allow software to interconnect, and finally, top-level applications, so things that you actually use as a user or you may use in businesses like salesforce.com, that kind of stuff. Um, so in order for us to make this sort of theoretically correct, uh, I want to remind people that you know, our chief philosopher of at least Ethereum, and maybe we'll say one of the top ones of all of blockchains, Vitalik, a while back, talked about three decentralization axes. And it's very important to be kind of precise when we talk about decentralization, because decentralization is a little different on different axes. I'm going to do two things to his, his diagram, which is very good. But for the sake of this, political decentralization is a little bit confusing. It sounds like we're talking about voting. We're not. We're talking about financial, financial centralization and decentralization. Who controls the money? Who controls the access to make money? Who controls? the ability to get value from the money that's made. And then the second is logical decentralization is not so relevant because actually both types are fine depending on the kind of software or thing you're building. Sometimes you want to have global synchronization. Sometimes it's OK to be local. So uh, we get this simplified view. OK, we're going to come back to this in a little bit and talk about where does things like AWS and Azure and Google Cloud, which we all use, uh, fit on this compared to where we want the, the decentralized public cloud to be. So 
let's break down because a lot of people think about the public cloud, and I've heard this very often, and they feel, public cloud, it's decentralized, it's distributed. I've got servers all over the world, I can set them up wherever I want. You know, if something breaks down here, it's got lots of redundancy, I can do things over there, it feels fine. And so that's completely correct. We actually ha can say for sure that the architecture of public clouds are decentralized. And they're done very well, and they perform extremely well. They're a very high bar for us to hit in terms of the decentralized public cloud. But now let's go through these other three things that are all financial metrics. Let's look at who controls the billing system of the public cloud. You may forget, but when you originally set up your AWS account, it was very convenient. You put in a credit card, and after that, you don't have to think about it again. I mean, you get a bill, or you give it to your CFO or CIO, whatever, but it's, it's a centralized thing. So <clears throat> behind the scenes, every time you're using the infrastructure on a public cloud, it's being metered. You're doing your API calls, you're doing some data moving through the network, whatever. It's being checked and counted by those public cloud providers. This is not a small task, and it's a huge centralizing thing that has to be done by them and completely controlled by the public clouds. Second is pricing provider access. Very opaque. I mean, obviously, it goes down a little bit, but you can kind of look at it from the beginning of the public cloud to now. There's been sort of a splitting the difference. The actual costs go down, but only the cost savings that we see is a fraction of that. And I'll talk about that when we talk about uh, good and bad things. And then the value earning access. If you are a shareholder in the company, then you get the value out of the public cloud uh, because it's actually going to increase your stock price. If you are somebody who's actually bringing revenue to the cloud, you're going to end up splitting with the cloud, and you're not going to benefit from that. So there is this sort of middleman, which we know very much uh, is always at risk of run-seeking. So now going back to Vitalik's simplified diagram, you know, we can show the two things. The reason why public clouds seem to be decentralized is because they are architecturally, but we, our ideal decentralized public cloud is going to fit on this right side. And just very briefly, you know, public cloud market is extremely dominated by a couple of uh, key players. We all use them. The scale of revenue in the space is a little bit surprising if you've never looked at the financials. It's going up 20, 30% a year. It's now crossed 300 billion across the space, and it's going up. So from you know, not an economics 101 point of view, but from an econ one point of view, so not just supply demand, but demand, the cloud is a great place to actually bring revenue into the blockchain space and to settle in blockchain. So this should be very interesting to all of us. The other thing I was going to say is in terms of all of us or most of us being open source software developers, there's a lot of kind of capture in this space. When software developers go out to the public cloud, they're in an asymmetric relationship with the public cloud providers. If they charge through the public cloud, there's a cut taken, just like the Apple Store. It's been very successful. Everybody has to pay it. And then there's this problem of open source software undercutting. And so I just show a picture here that, you know, a long time back, open source software, which we all would love to be able to do and, you know, uh, have a lot of control over the kind of projects we work on, it has an open core model where you try to have a lot of the software be developed fully in the open, lots of community based. And everybody sort of says, yeah, there's features that you add that are valuable and companies pay for it. And that's the kind of added top layer around it. That's the original vision. That started working well in the 2000s. Then public cloud came along. That ended up getting split. And the cloud vendors actually take open source and do their own in-house version of that open source. But they're not the original project. And you know, I, somebody could tell me if they know other examples. But in general, like MongoDB is a good example. Very public, the open source projects just say you know, it's actually a negative effect on the open source space. <clears throat> so, Two things that I'll say for devs and users, because maybe we don't care about the open source companies, but devs and users that are using the uh, public cloud, I just call it suboptimal pricing. And you know, I don't want to come across from this talk that public clouds are evil and other things. In fact, I think public clouds can definitely participate and bolster up the initial performance and capacity of our decentralized protocols. They can make money from it as well. But we have to be conscious about what happens when somebody controls all of the resources? They have both sides of the marketplace, people who are consuming the infrastructure and the software, and then the people who are building that software. And you get suboptimal pricing. And there's a lot of them that you can kind of look in, but like one of the ones I like the best 
uh, is you know, Cloudflare, which is very strongly kind of going after different models, and they're actually getting a lot into the decentralized space. Who here has used IPFS through Cloudflare? Give them a shout out. They have a really nice, reliable, uncensored um, IPFS, which I love that they've stuck with that idea, and they support a lot of companies and a lot of independent people with DDoS protection. So uh, great place. So if you look on the right side, they did a conservative calculation because they didn't want to like be overly extreme. But you know, when you're paying for your egress fees out of a public cloud, two, three, four cents a gigabyte to get data out, in the US and other places, you're paying 80 times the cost of providing that. And that's conservative. Okay, it didn't start out that way. It actually started out more like this three to four X kind of number that you see in South Korea. But that's sort of the progress when you have a monopoly position. You start off with a relatively low you know, tax on top of it, and then you increase it over time. That's what rent-seeking behavior looks like. So just calling that out, I mean, public clouds are very good, and I'm not saying they're terrible, but you know, we just want to recognize part of the thing that we like in decentralization, getting power, is to have actually more of this exposed to the users and the people who are creating the software and the value. And then suboptimal feature roadmaps. I think the highlight one, there's a lot of them, one of the highlight ones is, you know, who here is excited about trying to get software to work in Amazon and then recreating the infrastructure in Azure or in Google Cloud or somewhere else? None of us are. So decentralized protocols, the idea is that, you know, no one owns them. You, you don't have a lock into one vendor where they've integrated into the stack. Anybody can go in, take it. If ever the protocol becomes sort of, you know, you don't like the way the DAO is running, you can fork it and restart it. So the ability to kind of exit is important, and you don't see features, realistically, you don't see features that allow for that. There are vendors who try to do it, but it's, it's kind of like going after compatibility. So billing tech, uh, now that we've kind of covered all of that, let's talk about the performance that's going to be needed for decentralized public cloud. And I just want to say flat out, you know, we're not talking about hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. We need to be able to do billions of transactions per second. There are so many API calls that are going around in the world. Latencies of you know, hundreds of milliseconds are nice, but you know, the actual billing and the metering on AWS, it's all handled in microseconds. We need to get there too. And we need the cost to be nanocents, nano and I could just say you know, picocents, femtocents, just tiny, tiny numbers. It needs to be down at the cost that you know, it's only the overhead of like a little bit of additional cryptography that's going along with the metering that's probably in there in your connections anyway. So layer one blockchains, we know are out. They're not going to hit this. They're really settlement layer. There was a lot of excitement uh, when rollups were discovered, and they're a great way for us to scale out blockchain transactions. So love them entirely. We've got to use them. But there's a technology, and I'm going to say a little wah, 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 <laughs> because Back in 2018, 19, uh, before we had rollups, there was a lot of idea about state channels being a scaling technology. And then rollups came out, we didn't need state channels to scale blockchains anymore. So most people in the world stopped doing state channels. Happily, at Consensus Mesh, we've had an uh, R&D group, Magmo, that's kept going on with it. And they've done a great job on state channels. And they've improved from the state channels that you know your, your grandmother or father knew. <laughs> to a second generation that's way more significant for us. So let me just reintroduce original state channels were uh, hash time lock contracts, idea very similar to like Bitcoin Lightning. And the problem with them is that you have to exit all the time to the chain. And the intermediaries that facilitate transactions are in the middle of every transaction. So latency as well as scaling, it's not going to get there. So what actually it originated, uh, I believe, for the most part, and the uh, founder of the Magmo group, um, that this idea of virtual channels. And in virtual channels, you create a new layer where the base ledger technology, ledger channel that connects to the blockchain, that stays there pretty much indefinitely. You have a relationship to a payment provider, payment facilitator. Could be a decentralized party, it could be a bank. You could just go into this through a credit card or through crypto. And when you want to do a transaction, they facilitate a channel but they set up a channel at a higher layer, a virtual channel, where you're now talking directly peer-to-peer -peer on the other end of the same TCP connection that you're doing your service with. So these virtual channels get you down to microseconds, and they achieve the transaction scaling because you get the thousands, 10,000s scaling that you get if you're only going to your uh, getting a bill once a month and settling up. And the virtual channels are 
infinite. I mean, everything you do in that month is captured. So the scaling is able to handle the public cloud. So here I just put the names. When you look at the slides, you'll see sort of the API version of an incentivized API. And then normally I don't try to show a complicated diagram, but I want to emphasize this is a big complicated problem. We're talking about scale of these payment channels being billions, tens of billions in them standing. I mean, every server that's connected to any other microservice has one of these open across the peer relationships. So I show a little example of it here, but I mean, it's just so much bigger than that, and the virtual channels are everywhere. But it's distributed through all the servers. It's not going through a consensus of a blockchain, so it'll scale. Uh, it works. So, and then just going back from that view, from the developer point of view, they never want to see this when they're doing a SaaS or PaaS project. They just want to see something that works. So from them, what they see is an API that gets them a payment channel in addition to the one where they're doing their actual data or service microchannel. And money flows one way, data service flows the other, meterings included. Filecoin retrieval payments are an early example. Just want to say we have examples of that already, and we should be really expanding them a lot more. So, oh good, I'm in good time, four minutes. I've got only two slides left. So um, where are we today? If you want to check it out, there's an example we did a couple of years back just to sort of test out when state channels went out of vogue with roll-ups. Could we add this to like peer-to-peer -peer projects and do something to an existing code base? So the team took the WebTorrent um, code base and they made a service called Web3Torrent. You can try it out, it's on Girly Network if you follow the link. Uh, and remember, I, I have all the slides are gonna be on my Twitter, at RJ Drost. Um, so you can follow that and check it out. Um, you know, you can download a file from it. I mean, it's a POC thing, so you just kind of try it out. But if you set up a few machines, download a file, start serving it, you'll see that there's actually incentivization and tokens uh, that are being exchanged. And uh, that was sort of a toy example POC. Um, luckily, the people at Filecoin were really intrigued with this. They wanted to get to the scale on Filecoin Saturn, which is the very exciting Web3 CDN that they're putting in front of Filecoin that gets things like IPFS and Filecoin down in its initial versions down to the low 100 millisecond kind of range. And in the second version, we'll be able in like local geos to get down really to like that tens of milliseconds, very high performance range. Obviously in a data center, it can be in microseconds at any point as long as you're pinned to the same data. So, and that's the plan. This is actually coming online this year. We have it working, but it's gonna be a lot of productization and then the network has to get stood up and so forth. So where do we aim to go? So right now we've got the first proof points. We've got the state channel technology that can actually get to that performance. It's all being done as a public good, open source project. The intention is that this is something that we should see all over the place as another crypto economic primitive that you can integrate into the blockchain on one side and then offer developers on the other. Um, still a lot of development to go, but we're gonna keep doing it this way. Um, and uh, you know, we want these incentivized APIs to be easy for adding to any project. And, um, you know, like, really easy. Like, the next version is an RPC library, so it abstracts away a lot of things that make it kind of complicated to deal with. And then the version after that, I mean, there's, you know, things like uh, open API, API generators. Uh, you know, we're looking into, can it actually be something that people who are doing, you know, SaaS software or PaaS software, and they generate 30 different APIs out of it that we can just actually have the payment abstracted away that just semantically tell OpenAPI, here's the blockchain, here's the payment provider network, and then here's the API uh, technology primitive. And, um, you know, like, there are a lot of open source projects that are never gonna really know about blockchain, but they're gonna want to run on decentralized public cloud infrastructure. We want anybody who's doing an open source project in that open core model, or you know, even altruistic, but definitely open core models to say the decentralized public cloud is a thing that we all collectively are building the lower level IAAS for and that MongoDB and load balancers and orchestrators and all of the stuff above up to the software layer can run on and we can start actually, you know, appearing on those graphs and being a decentralized public cloud. So thank you very much. I'll do one shout out for the group because they're a great team. I don't do any of this work. I just have the pleasure of being um, the head of R&D. So they're an awesome group of guys. You can see they're mountain climbers from Alex. And uh, they are hiring. So if you are interested in getting into this field and you like doing open source public good stuff, follow, uh, or follow me right now. I just need to make sure that we actually have the job link correct on there. It may not be right after I post it there. I noticed it seemed to disappear. But uh, thank you very much. All right. Pleasure talking to you today.